how does it start? It's really interesting. That for me, this this book has such a long gestation period. Um, well, obviously, you know, I I, I I live in Victoria. I grew up with Ned Kelly. Uh, I live in Australia. I grew up with Ned Kelly. But the the thing that I most vividly remember uh, was walking into uh, George's in Collins Street, 1962, I think, and then there was uh, an exhibit of Sidney Nolan's paintings of of uh, well, it's called the Kelly series. Uh, it was the second serious exhibition I'd ever been to in my life. And the previous one was only a couple of weeks before that. And it just knocked my socks off. And, uh, and it stayed with me, burnt into my brain and, and I, forever. And not long after that, I read somewhere, two or three years probably, uh, the Gerildry Letter. Didn't see it, of course, because there was no way to see it then. And, um, but I was so taken with this writing that uh, I typed it all up in my very, you know, thumpy, <laughs> inelegant typing. And I'd just been reading, I'd just discovered at the same time James Joyce and I'd discovered Beckett. And there were these other very strong Irish literary voices running in my head. Also writers that didn't um, use a lot of commas and full stops. And so I read or misread the Gerildery letter in that particular way that... Uh, in a way that really, really excited me. And, I, and I, the reason I typed it up is that I knew, well, I thought I was a writer then, but I knew one day at least I would be a writer and I'd do something with it. Now, there have been some good things written about Kelly, of course. You know, Bob Drew wrote a wonderful book called Our Sunshine. And you've got to believe me that I thought it was a wonderful book because I got a blurb on the back of it. Um, and, and Jean Bedford also, and Douglas Stewart. But I still was conceited enough to think I could add something extra to this. Um, and when I thought about it, there was only one way I wanted to do it. The one voice that was in my ear was Ned Kelly's voice in this Gerildery letter. And it really was like, it seemed to me like, you know, this was the character's DNA. And one could really hope to inhabit the character of Ned Kelly through the voice of the Gerildery letter. And my original ambition was really just to begin at the beginning of the Gerildery letter and write another 300 pages, you know, as if that, you know, it didn't work out like that, of course. Well, you know, there are a whole lot of ways in which we sort of be, be, become used to thinking about Ned Kelly. And, and I think as the years have gone by, that, that, that's the, it's funneled in to being pretty much about the armour and, and perhaps less and less about the man behind it. And uh, these, are, these are, I suppose, relics. Um, and the armour does have all sorts of stories and ideas associated with it. But there are other things that we, I think we've forgotten, or I for one really just didn't even know about. And uh, I think one of the more moving objects, things associated with Ned Kelly is this green sash that he was given for um, saving the life of a little Protestant boy uh, at Avenal whose name was, I've forgotten his first name now, was it Dick Shelton, anyway. Uh, I know it was Shelton because, the, yeah, that little boy's descendants uh, are alive and thriving as a result of, uh, of Ned Kelly's, the young Ned Kelly's heroism. Anyway, as a result of him saving this little boy from drowning, he was given this green sash. So the Protestant community gives the Irish boy the green sash. And uh, we know how much that meant to him. And remember, so sorry to, to go back. You know, remember too, you know, that the Irish are at the bottom of the pecking order. That Avenel's a very English sort of a town with people with English names, and the Kellys were way down there. So he's given given this green sash, and this is the day I think that he is seen as a as a good citizen. His courage is recognised, and he's in, included in the community. We know how much it meant to him because on the last free day of his life, at the at the, at the uh, siege at Glen Rowan, he was wearing this same green sash under the armour. And uh, it tells us so much uh, about, it perhaps tells us a lot more than the armour tells us about him. So it was, now I'd seen a photograph of it, I, I only discovered quite late in the process that such a thing had ever existed. Uh, but I was on a research trip up to, um, you know, to what's called Kelly Country. And I was with my friend Richard Laplastria 
and Laurie Muller from University of Queensland Press. And Laurie had driven down and already found out that this sash was in this little museum in Benalla. And so after we'd got bought the leg of lamb and the various things that we were going to take out into the bush with us, uh, Laurie said, oh, there's, a little, there's a little Kelly museum in here. Yeah, maybe you should have a look at it. And I walked in that door and there was that damn green sash. Very, very, very moving. Uh, I think when I think about the ways that we represent Kelly um, to ourselves, uh, what pictures the newspapers want it, and I, you know, they want the death mask, the, the armour and the old engraving of their shooting. Um, I think there are other more telling things that we could sometimes look at, and I think the green sash is one of them. It, it's, a, it's an odd thing. It's physically very, very beautiful. Uh, it's also interesting to reflect that it was taken from his body, if I'm not wrong, by the doctor who was there to save him. Souvenired it like so many parts of this story were souvenired and only surfaced quite recently. Well, the, the thing that really most engaged me with the, the problems of writing Ned Kelly is that you know, we have these bits of the story that we know so well, almost like the Stations of the Cross in a way. There's this bit and that bit and that bit. Uh, but we really have no idea what happened between this bit and that bit. And so the, there's a huge pleasure in, in inventing a whole world that's consistent with what is known, but is unlike anything anybody ever imagined about the Kelly story before, and in which you have to have your characters walking out the door they're known to have walked out of, and walking in the door that they're known to have walked into. And um, so, you know, there's one way of reading it where you can read that and think, well, it's not very invented. But in fact, it's the most uh, invented, made up book I've ever written. I lost my own father at 12 year of age and know what it is to be raised on lies and silences. My dear daughter, you are presently too young to understand a word I write. But this history is for you and will contain no single lie. May I burn in hell if I speak false. God willing, I shall live to see you read these words, to witness your astonishment and see your dark eyes widen and your jaw drop when you finally comprehend the injustice we poor Irish suffered in this present age. How queer and foreign it must seem to you, and all the coarse words and cruelty which I now relate are far away in ancient time. Your grandfather were a quiet and secret man. He had been ripped from his home in Tipperary and transported to the prisons of Van Diemen's land. I do not know what was done to him. He never spoke of it. When they had finished with their tortures, they set him free and he crossed the sea to the colony of Victoria. He were by this time thirty year of age, red-headed and freckled, with his eyes always slitted against the sun. My da had sworn an oath to evermore avoid the attentions of the law, so when he saw the streets of Melbourne was crawling with policemen worse than flies, he walked twenty miles to the township of Donnybrook, and then or soon thereafter he seen my mother. Ellen Quinn were eighteen year old, she were dark haired and slender, the prettiest figure on a horse he ever saw. But your grandma were like a snare laid out by God for Red Kelly. She were a Quinn, and the police would never leave the Quins alone. My first memory is of mother breaking eggs into a bowl and crying that Jimmy Quinn, my 15-year-old uncle, were arrested by the traps. I don't know where my daddy were that day, nor my older sister Annie. I was three year old. While my mother cried, I scraped the sweet yellow batter onto a spoon and ate it. The roof were leaking above the camp oven, each drop hissing as it hit. My mother tipped the cake into the muslin cloth and knotted it. Your Auntie Maggie were a baby, so my mother wrapped her also. Then she carried both cake and baby out into the rain. I had no choice but follow up the hill. How could I forget them puddles, the colour of mustard, the rain like needles in my eyes? We arrived at the beverage police camp, drenched to the bone, and doubtless stank of poverty, a strong odour about us, like wet dogs, and for this or other reasons we was excluded from the sergeant's room. I remember sitting with my chill blind hands wedged beneath the door. I could feel the lovely warmth of the fire on my fingertips. Yet when we was finally permitted entry, 
all my attention were taken not by the blazing fire, but by a huge red jowl creature, the Englishman, who sat behind the desk. I knew not his name, only that he were the most powerful man I ever saw, and he might destroy my mother if he so desired. 